when he was attacking Vice President Harris, he said she is, quote, more liberal than Bernie Sanders. <laughs> is that how you would put it? Uh, probably not. I, I, it is just possible for the 83rd thousand time that uh, Trump is lying. No, I don't think that is uh, the case. That's independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont laughing off former President Trump's claim that Vice President Kamala Harris is more liberal than he is. Now, tomorrow marks just 100 days until Election Day in November, 100 days. And the vice president's campaign announced a major nationwide push for this weekend, holding more than 2,000 events in battleground states and mobilizing 170,000 new volunteers. Let's now bring in Pete Buttigieg. He is joining us this morning in his personal capacity and not speaking on behalf of the Biden administration. Uh, Mayor Pete, good to see you. Um, you have been bandied about as a possible running mate choice for Vice President Harris. So have you been contacted by the campaign and would you be interested in serving in that role? Look, I think anybody would be flattered to be mentioned in that context. I certainly am. Uh, there's really not much more that I can or should say about that process other than that she's going to make that decision and she knows what she's doing. Uh, what I know is that uh, I'm really excited in whatever capacity uh, to be part of this campaign. And I'm one of millions of Democrats who are clearly energized and fired up. There's just a, a new energy. And it's been extraordinary to me how quickly she has gathered the party around her uh, with a, a sense of mission, a clear message, uh, just in a matter of days. And uh, of course, I'm thrilled to be part of that. It seems as if that sense of mission and enthusiasm has rattled Republicans, at least for the moment. And as we covered earlier in the show, um, Donald Trump and his campaign have suggested that he may not uh, follow through uh, with the debate in September that had been scheduled uh, to be with President Biden. Now, of course, would be the vice president, assuming she does wrap up the nomination, as expected. Uh, what do you make of that? It's extraordinary. Tough talk is this guy's calling card. And now there's this extraordinary show of weakness. He agreed to, you know, he said any time, any place. Uh, but more than that, he agreed to this specific debate on this specific network on this specific date. And now he's pulling out. And of course, it shows that he's afraid. It shows that he knows if the two of them are on a stage together, uh, it's not going to end well for him. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a campaign that, that uh, really has struggled to be about anything but Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And I think that's the bigger pattern that you're seeing here and part of why uh, the Trump campaign is having such a hard time adapting. Uh, think about it. Just in a matter of two or three days, our campaign adapted to literally the biggest possible change, uh, which is uh, a, a change in the top of the ticket. And yet, uh, you know, with, within a couple of days, that, that support consolidated and that message was clear. They, meanwhile, have been flailing in a way that shows they're unable to adapt. And to me, it's not just that their entire strategic apparatus was built around tearing down Joe Biden. I think there's something deeper, which is Donald Trump cannot conceive of a campaign that isn't about the candidate. Uh, you know, we're obviously very excited about our candidate. Uh, Kamala Harris is a leader that, that everybody is pulling together around, but also she's articulating a message that isn't about just about herself and, and certainly isn't just about Donald Trump, although she has that contrast down. It's about us. And that's the kind of campaign that, that wins. It's the, the right kind of campaign. And it's also one that literally mm -hmm. does not compute for somebody like Donald Trump. So you, of course, just mentioned the huge change at the top of the ticket, a seismic change, a dizzying week of change. For you yourself, on, on, on Friday night, you appeared in real time with Bill Maher talking about President Biden, advocating uh, for his candidacy, wanting him to stay in the race. And then, of course, two days later, he announced he is uh, bowing out. Um, what has this week been like for you? Well, obviously, it's been intense. It's been emotional, especially watching President Biden's Oval Office address, uh, watching him do what uh, is so incredibly rare, which is for uh, a leader with that kind of responsibility and power to uh, lay it aside, uh, to relinquish the nomination, focus on leading the country. And again, the, the words that most spoke to me was when he said that that sacred trust in our democracy, he said, it's not about me, it's about you and your families. And, and, and it reminded 
invited me, well, I'm, I'm so proud uh, to, uh, uh, to be part of, uh, of that team. Uh, but the other thing I would say is while the, the top of our ticket has changed, of course, the values have not. And uh, I'm especially excited to see the way she's leaning into freedom, uh, a value and a theme that, as, as you know, uh, really for, for years and, and back to my own presidential campaign, it's frustrated me that conservatives tried to monopolize the, the language around freedom. Uh, I think they have even more completely relinquished any claim to being able to talk about freedom when they got into banning books. And she has spoken so powerfully, uh, as she did yesterday, when she was addressing America's mm -hmm. teachers to the fact that if, if you mean business when it comes to protecting our kids, uh, you shouldn't be protecting our kids from Toni Morrison. You should be protecting our kids from assault weapons. So, Pete, uh, historian John Meacham has the next question for you. Mr. Mayor, a uh, quick question. Uh, you are an anomaly in that you are a uh, young person in uh, politics and public service who seems to actually enjoy it. Uh, I'm wondering, given the uh, course of the 21st century, uh, given the fact that the public arena again and again has proven to not be commensurate to what people want, uh, we begin with the terrible attacks, we go through insurrection. What's the story, now that you've been mayor, you've uh, been in a big job, what's the story you tell about why politics, why public service matters? You, you know, it's a, a great point. Like generationally, I think anyone my age and younger, uh, especially in, in the first part of, of this century, witnessed a, a lot of policy failure. Uh, so part of my, my message, my antidote to that is to look at what's been achieved these last few years and most importantly, what that could point to for the future. Uh, I think about my own trajectory. The, the, the fact that, that uh, just the fact of somebody like me uh, being able to have a role like I do or run a campaign like we did would have been considered preposterous just 10 or 20 years ago. I think of the trajectory of, of um, South Bend, Indiana, where I served as mayor and where I grew up, a place that in less than a decade uh, changed the narrative about that from being written up in, in national uh, commentaries as a dying Rust Belt city to being a city that was growing and, and was being regarded as a place full of innovation and, and energy. And of course, I think about uh, serving in a, a Biden-Harris administration and, and watching what happened. I mean, take infrastructure, right, where uh, there was this belief that you just couldn't, even though there was this thing that obviously needed to be done, uh, and yet it just couldn't happen. No president could get it through. Definitely couldn't happen on a bipartisan basis, only to see the Biden-Harris administration deliver that. Uh, and I think that lights the way toward what is possible. And as, as you mentioned, there's also just something in this moment, just this week's moment, about that idea of enjoying this a little more. Uh, politics doesn't have to be a death match. You know, we, we have uh, certainly uh, seen and had cause for being extremely troubled and disturbed by what's coming out of the other side. Uh, I think we continue to be right to talk about the, uh, the, the threat and, and the concern for our democracy. If you have a guy like Donald Trump who, uh, who inspired the January 6th uh, riots and, and, and uh, attempt uh, against our democracy, somebody who talks about terminating the Constitution and said that a political opponent of his ought to be brought before him a military tribunal like that's that's really dark but the other side of the coin is the joy of the right and better kind of politics and we've seen that throughout the week and again it's something that i think is animating our side and that the other side literally can't conceive. And that's uh, why some of their attacks that have fallen flat kind of re reveal that there's just a different energy, a different vibe over there. The fact that they, for example, clip and tweet images of Kamala Harris laughing uh, as if that's something that counts against her <laughs> it shows that they, they, they literally are having trouble just getting uh, the idea of there being joy in the in the struggle and in in the challenge uh, but but i think that's something that that speaks more to the campaign than voters i think there are a lot of independents and what i always mm -hmm. like to call future former republicans uh, who would rather just sign up and be part of this project than uh, continue to be part of this this doom filled whatever we saw at the rnc pete Buttigieg, thank you for joining us this morning again in his personal capacity we appreciate it Thanks.